Hello again, everybody. I'm Phil Liggett, and welcome along to one of our other famous cycling videos. This is the 56 running of the Ghent Wavelgum Classic, over 208 kilometres. And the riders assembling, as they have this last couple of years, in what is really a big garage just adjacent to the six days track here on the outskirts of Ghent. And this is Johan Museo, and now we have Marc Sejon, a man of the spring classics, especially when they're in Belgium. Eric van der Aarden won the race back in 1985 and was indeed second last year. And on a new team this year. And Johan Capio, a rider who's never won this race despite his great ability in the early season classics. He's won Het Volk, of course, and second last year. Gianni Bugno, the winner of Tour de Flanders. And Cipollini, he's made this race his over the last few years. And I wonder if it will indeed be a bunch sprint. The organizers going out of their way to try and stop this race finishing in a big group. Fabio Baldato, the Italians on form as ever, especially over these last two or three years. And that is Ballerini and the face here of Franz Masson, winner of the Amstel Gold Race, former champion of Holland and the best sprinter of them all. I don't suppose Cipollini would agree with me, Abdu Japarov. Uzbekistan. The field assembling indoors, but I'm afraid outdoors. The rain is coming down quite heavily. It's very cold, although the forecast for later in the day is sunny periods and the wind will continue to blow. Well, we could say that is a typical spring forecast in the heart of Belgium. This race going out on the flat roads for a considerable distance. Smiling face here of Olaf Ludwig, not too happy with the weather. 1988 Seoul Olympic champion and an extremely good professional. Most unpleasant conditions and the spray off the wheels there hitting the riders right in the face. This is the first climb of the Kemmelberg. We'll come up it again near the end, much more crucial then. But it's uh, naturally turning out to be the first selection here, I think. And Ballerini is on the left of our picture and riding very, very strongly too. Here's a man who so nearly wins the big races, but never quite does get the victory he so much wants. So the riders coming up the Kemmelberg, this time more or less all together, although one or two are being stretched out here. Cobbled all the way up, and more importantly in these conditions, it's cobbled all of the way down. It's a very treacherous descent with a sharp bend halfway down. And I speak uh, from experience, having ridden Belgian amateur classics over this climb. And this is Ballerini and Johan Museo. And they have stretched the field. They are pulling people clear here. This is quite clearly an early attack. There's 133 kilometres of undulating road now, right through to the finish. In all, 16 climbs make up Ghent Wavelgum now, as the organisers fight to reroute the course and try and stop the inevitable bunch spins we've had over the years gone by. The main field might be unwise to let the breakaways form on this climb. And this is the long descent I was talking about. And the crowd can stay here and await the return of the race. There's nice coffee shops on the top of this climb. And so on the first descent of the Kemmelberg, the gaps are opening. And among the riders not in that leading group, certainly Gianni Bugno is not there. And that looked like it might have been Frankie Andreo going through there from the Motorola team. Adrie van der Poel. Five silver medals in the World Cyclocross Championship and has never had a championship win. So that was the first climb over the Kemmelberg. Now we can go and join the riders as the formation at the front as we head out now towards the climb of the Mont Noir. The Black Mountain, and as you can see down there, a breakaway which has been really in front almost all of the day since the Kemmelberg. Bugno and the big group of riders have tried desperately to make contact. Cipollini has missed the move as well. And this is a group numbering around about 21 riders, but as we look, you can see they're already splitting up once again. Now we'll get down there as quickly as we can and see who's in this leading group. And we can see right away that the GBMG boys are well represented. And this uh, right up the road there is Ludwig Willems. And Cipollini's group is 20 seconds behind at the minute. Andre Schmill is the lotto rider on the left in the red. Wilfred Peters for GB. And there's an awful lot of GB riders have got themselves into this leading group. Three, six, eight, nine, ten riders forming down there now. They've realised, in fact, that if they can get rid of Cipollini at this early stage, he won't like the pressure going on on the climb of Montoir. 
It's just over two kilometers, a little more than a mile and a quarter this climb. It's about 10%. It hurts like all of these short climbs. This is Max Chandri, who was part of the Motorola team last year. He's moved across to an Italian team. Strange anomaly of a man. He was born in Derby in England. He raced last year for an American team, and of course he is a naturalized Italian these days. 52 kilometers to the finish. That's about 32 miles to race. Roscioli here getting down it. What a great week he's had, winning the three days of La Panna in Belgium. And now beginning to realize he is a winner after that great long lone breakaway in the Tour de France in the south of France last year when he won the stage there. You may remember then he promised to take out all of his next door neighbors for dinner if he won the stage in the Tour de France. I think it cost him a few lira because he had 25 for dinner after his victory. Looking back from the helicopter, the gap has opened enormously after the climb of the Mont Noir. And that group of three, six, eight riders includes Cipollini and they're losing ground. And one rider has realized that that group isn't going quick enough and he's trying to get across the gap on his own. But the men who have triumphed, and indeed the men who've made this race all day with more than a little help from Ballerini from the Mapai class team, has been the MGGB boys. Crossing from the France uh, countryside back into Belgium, the race making a deviation these years now, just across the borders, as they so often do to climb Mont Cassel, a hill which is used continually in the four days of Dunkirk, which is in fact a race over six days, but in the old days it was called and was the four days of Dunkirk. And the traditional opening to the season as the riders always come into the area of northern France and Belgium. But the weather now has turned out to be extremely pleasant indeed. A bit windy, but the chill air warmed a little by the sunshine now and the clear blue skies. We had the heavy rain right out at the beginning, but that's gone away as we dropped away from the northern coastline of Belgium and headed into the little bergs of Flanders and then across the border into Montcassel and the riders continuing to attack on the break here. Well, you know, if these attacks keep going like this, the Cipollini bunch are not going to come back. The main field have really never been in contention and there's the composition of the breakaway. In fact, the rider on the right there, Vina Dutzi, I think should be Dmitry Konishev, the Russian rider, for the Jolly team because he's the name not in this list and in fact he should be. Just look at the number of riders here riding for the MGGB team. What a start to the season this team really has made. They're a complete outfit and they're riding all for one and one for all. Johan Museu still smarting a little bit after his defeat in the Tour of Flanders by Gianni Bugno, but Gianni Bugno springboarded to victory there by a wonderful attack from Andrea Perron, his teammate from Polti. But Bunyo not enjoying Gent Wevelgum. He's uh, one of the riders quite a way down. The move went a little bit too early for him. Quite often riders don't expect the attacks to go soon. It's a good gamble, a good tactic. And clearly Johan Museo today has come out thinking of an early attack. And there he is now driving this group along. We're in the narrow roads now, just about room for one vehicle. 49 kilometers to go down to the finish. Vestuta is where we are. So just about 29 kilometers to race. Let me give you the full composition again of this breakaway. Fabio Roscioli is here, the winner of the three days of La Panna. Dmitry Konishev from the Jolly team. The one they'll worry about, Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov from the Palti team. They'll be delighted though to know that Cipollini hasn't made the split. Zbigniew Spruk from the Lamprey team, missing of course their leader at the minute. And that is Maurizio Fondriest out with an injury. Andre Schmill of Lotto. Ludwig Willems of GB, now all of the GB team as we look at the picture here of Max Chiandri. Ludwig Willems, Wilfred Peters, Johan Museu, Carlo Bowmans, Rolf Jarman and Max Chiandri. All of those riders from the GB team and they're probably going to have to do all of the driving now because the others will be foolish to help out. And the one name I didn't give you there, uh, Franco Ballerini. And Guy Nolan's another one for Nova Mai. He'll be in the blue jersey. And so that is the composition of this leading group as we head up now the two kilometer climb of the Schkominkelberg, a 12% gradient at its steepest point. You can see we don't really reach any height here in Flanders. 
88 meters above sea level about 260 feet but the hills are short and they do hurt and not surprisingly the GB team are now being required to put all of the pressure on at the front and I think they won't object to doing that they're carrying along their team leader Johan Museu second in the World Cup last year and the win of course in the Tour de Flanders when he was the champion of Belgium and that gave him the most pleasure I'm sure of that Missed out on the medal in the World Championships, won so well by Lance Armstrong when he finished fourth and briefly held the yellow jersey in the Tour de France. Well, it's hard to imagine a couple of years ago, this is the man that broke his hip and missed out on the World Championships. He recovered completely and now in such a strong team, he was a member of the Lotto team. Now he's moved across, probably because of the money, to the Italian GBMG squad. And this group beginning to go away now, and it really is because of all of the riding by the Italian team. There's the 13 men, the Baker's dozen, as we would say in England. And continuing now to turn the screw a little bit tighter. And the men who ride the Bianchi bicycles really are dictating the pace. In fact, this uh, setting the pace up here is Peters, Wilfred Peters, who's bringing the race up, doing an excellent job as the workhorse of the group. And there's the lineup again. Andre Schmill is a rider they should worry about. He's a very consistent top performer. Abdu Japarov, they will not want to take him along uh, to the final sprint. And Max Chandri still searching for a big classic victory. Never sure whether Max Chiandri is a sprinter or a long-distance roadman because he is a good sprint finisher, but he never quite finishes off with a victory. There's the gap, 50 seconds for the Museo group. Johan Museo, beaten just a few days ago in the Tour de Flanders by Gianni Bunyo, a race assuredly he should have won for a second year in succession. Guy Nullen's going through in the blue jersey. And number 18 sitting at the back here is the GB colours of Ludwig Willems. They really have some firepower up here now. They've hardly left the team man back in the main field. And that's Dmitry Konishev in the lime green colours of the Jolly team. The first of the Russians really to make such a big impression on the professional scene. Came to the fore when he took the silver medal behind Greg LeMond when Greg won his second world championship down in Chambéry. Sean Kelly was third. The wind keeping the riders pinned to the right hand side of the road, coming across the field here. Ballerini. Well, they've got one powerhouse in Ballerini, but I think even Ballerini will feel a little bit overawed now with the presence of six of these GB boys. The Lamprey rider is Spruk in the pink and blue. Abdu Japarov, the little crouch figure sitting in amongst the wheels. A superb team time trial going on here. And Carlo Bowmans, the old champion of Belgium, he really has settled down with Johan Museo in this team. And here we are, heading along the route towards Wavelgum. 16 climbs, the order of the day. Kemmel top coming just before the end. And so if they're going to get rid of Abdu Japarov, it must be done by that cobble climb of the Kemmel again. Abdu Japarov, little squat figure sits there. Not a great deal of form coming from Jamaluddin just yet. He won stages three and eight in Paris Nice this year. But for a sprinter, he hasn't really appeared. His reputation is fearsome in Gent Wavergum, disqualified from the victory a couple of years ago, which went to Cipollini. I was actually at the race on that occasion. I felt he was very harshly treated by the chief commissaire because Cipollini gave as good as he got and I think a fair decision would have been to have let the result stand. But no, out went Jamaluddin Abdu Jafarov and victory went to Cipollini. So Jamaluddin has won the race only once. A minute, so it's going up. And it's all because of the hard work of the Italian team. Guy Nullens. 
man who's ridden, I think it is, 12 Tours de France. One of the most consistent riders still in the peloton. 26 miles to go to the finish. De Kleitje is where we are. I'm just wondering now uh, whether the museum is happy to let things tick over. He'd be pleased with the work rate of his team, that's for sure. They will know by the speed they're going, by the work rate, that the field behind is not going to close in too much on them because they're up around about 50 kilometers an hour, about 31 miles an hour, this team time trial. They'll be content to consolidate the gap before they start trying to work out exactly how they're going to rid themselves of the likes of Abdu Japarov. He's riding a very shrewd little race. He's always riding, you see, number three. Not going through, allowing the MG riders to come back in. The rider taking up the running there is Rolf Yerman in second place now. Feeling a little bit overawed by the company around him, I would imagine. Ballerini taking off a little bit of overclothing, deciding that this is the race now. Andre Schmiel in the red colours of Lotto. Great bonus to the Lotto team run by Jean-Luc Vandenbroek. Started out life as a junior champion on the track, junior world champion on the track before he became a fairly successful cyclist as a professional. He certainly had done a good job as a team manager too. And the group of Gianni Bugno now one minute, ten seconds back. He really has been on the defensive along with his teammate, Andrea Perron. And between them, they tore the breakaway to shreds in the recent Tour of Flanders that led to Bugno's victory, but I'm afraid the old act is going to have a problem today in Ghent Wavelgum and not going to get across at this rate because the losing ground, Roscioli, being content to sit last man. Zbigniew Spruk is there too. And Konishev, another name to watch out for. Hasn't done anything at all this season. Always seems to be at odds with his sponsors in the years gone by, especially with the TVM team. He settled down a little bit with the Jolly team. On to another short climb, just a little bit over half a mile, Le Kleitje Helliger. Steepest gradient of 10% or 1 in 10. And setting the pace here, Rolf Yerman. Surprising winner of the Amstel Gold Race last year when he beat Gianni Bugno in that very, very close spin finish. A little bit ragged at the back. In fact, Schmill's gone fair way out the back of this group, and I think it was to force the other two riders to come up. In fact, he wanted last man position there for some reason. He wanted to make the others come and do something through the line. 147, who's come on the back of this group here as we look down, is David Perona. Peter Fadazine. So this, in fact, is the second group on the road that we switched to here. And they're going well, but they're not closing down the gap at all. We should see Bunyo somewhere at the front. This is Dagotto Lauritsen from TVM. And that looks like Andrea Perron, the workhorse. What a great cyclist he's turning out to be. Such a powerful rider. Rode in the 1992 Barcelona Olympic Games, Peron. He came away with a silver medal. And there is Bugno, the team leaders there too. So Polti have three men here. And look, he wants this race to go. And yet he knows that up there is his teammate Abdu Japarov with the great sprint. But he still seems content to try and catch him. I'm not too sure what that tactic is. Because the face of Peron going through, he's been told to work his heart out here to get this group across. There's Peter Fadazai from Lotto. And Olaf Ludwig is also here. Now, if that group does get closed down, another danger man will be up with the leaders. But this group is looking a little bit ragged at times. As we go back up to the leaders, Roscioli still riding last man. We call in the ticket collector sitting round the back door there. Spruk and Connie Shev, and rightly so, they're not going to take on anybody here at the front when you've got so many teammates from one team. And it looks to me as though, in fact, Abdu Japarov has a problem here. He's easing back from the group, and it says he has a mechanical problem. Well, I don't quite know what it is. His tyres look hard enough to me, but maybe his back wheel has gone a bit off-centre. 
Well, I think Abdu Jafarov is in trouble, and it looks to me as though he's taking his foot out the clip. That's an awful shame. Abdu Jafarov has gone off the back of the group, and not surprisingly, the pressure being applied right at the front, and the man doing it is Rolf Yerman. Well, here he comes back again. He's had a good change and got back up very quickly, Abdu Jafarov. But I wonder if that's hurt him, because, of course, the Kemmelberg is still to come. Well, the Italians have started this season unbelievably well, having won more than 50 races already, the Italian riders in general. That second chase group is more Italian than anything else as well. And the vast majority in this front group as well are either Italians or certainly on an Italian team. Very compact group, and Abdu Jafarov is in there again. Tucked over to the far right after that chase and just uh, easing himself back into the idea of... Uh, Thinking about perhaps winning this sprint, the race that which has eluded him all except once. For one reason or another, good or for bad. Konishev, for me, is a dark horse here. He's sitting at the back. He's an opportunist. He's won a couple of stages of the Tour de France with opportune wins. He can win alone or in the sprint if things go well for him. And it looks as though Guy Nullens is going to get some information if the, if the Nova May car can get through. And it looks like he can't. No sign of weakness from anybody here. A lot of riders hanging on. This is the second group still on the road. And there's the makeup of the second group. Some good riders in this group. Andy Cerato, Kingi Alta, Joe Plankert, Frédéric Moncassin. French word perfect rider. Serves Canavan, number 106, new professional. I met him for the first time in his last year as an amateur when he raced in Hawaii, in the new tour of Hawaii, and also in the Commonwealth Bank Classic. Interesting rider, and he's in the second group. That's a good performance for him in his first year as a pro. He's with the TVM team. Up towards the Kemmel. And this surely has got to be where the GB boys might try to turn the screw just to see who is shirking at the back and who is genuinely sitting there. Nobody has helped them at all since this breakaway formed, and that were to be, was to be expected. 35 kilometres approximately from the finish now, that's something like 22 miles to go. And you can see the strength of the wind here on the flags coming right across, partly tail and then turning to the cross. And we're just about uh, oh, 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes to go, probably a little bit longer. And one or two riders beginning to show the pressure too. Andre Schmiel sitting last man. Rolf Jermann setting the pace. And Ballerini as ever. This man is so strong, he really should have a, a huge number of victories to his credit, but he hasn't. He's always missing out. Konishev still riding well there near the back of the group though. Guy Nullen struggling a little bit now. But these ride, I would like to know how many times Guy Nullen will have raced over the Kemmelberg over his long years as a professional and bounced down the cobbles on the other side as well. There he is, Guy Nullen in a little bit of trouble now on the climb because Ballerini is the man applying the pressure. Sitting in the saddle to hold his bike down on those cobblestones, just bounce away there, but he's trying desperately now to keep the pressure on and seeing if he can crack anybody. Museo's marked him closely. There's the gradient, 20% or one in five. It's a very steep and short climb. Andre Schmiel up behind him there too. And a good climb too by Abdu Jafarov, not far off the pace at all. And this is the chase group on the climb now. There's Ludwig. So they're lower down, down the slopes of the Kemmelberg. The crowd have enjoyed their day out here. As we go back up to the leaders now, and there's a rider moving clear. Well, I think it was Wilfred Peters who was trying to go clear. This is Bunyo. This is his last chance to try and get across. He's not going clear of the field at all. Dagot Lauritsen riding very well, just behind him in the TVM colours on the right. 
Andrea Curato from Mapai Class. And somebody in the crowd there, you can probably hear him, just spotted Bunyo at the front. Very popular rider, twice world champion, defended his title. But during his years of world, two years as world champion, he didn't win much else. And I think that was uh, Federic Moncassan, the sprinter, who's just been dropped from that chase group on the climb. Let's go back up to the leaders. We've got two of them going clear. Well, the picture tells its tale. Museo has gone up to Ballerini. So Ballerini has made the first move. Well, Museo will mark Ballerini for sure. Great rivals. They've so often come together in the classics. And Ballerini will not welcome the present of Museo because he knows that Museo will beat him in the sprint every time. So big Ballerini taking second place. Museo looking for a chance now to make his move. Safe in the knowledge his teammates behind will start the blocking tactics. Let's have a look back, see just how far a the gap. They've gone well, one rider clear. That's the chase group, the remnants of that original 13 men. Of whom six of them were GBMG riders. Incredible. That's Andre Schmil having to do some work now, which he hasn't done before, of course, but now he's got to close down that breakaway. Little rider from Moldavia. Although he considers himself a Russian, that's his uh, national tongue, is Russian. But living these days, just on the end of the Roubaix course, of Paris-Roubaix, which is where we will go with our next video for that great classic, and the bad weather in Europe this year, well, we could be in for a good one. Abdu Japarov trying to work his way back into the action, panicking a little bit perhaps now that Museo has slipped the pack along with Ballerini, two extremely strong men. And if they don't chase them down quickly, they will not catch them up, that's for sure. The great privilege of being on the back of a motorbike with our camera is that we can leave the chase group and go and find out just what is happening in the lead group. And there they are, the two of them. Ballerini, 29 years of age now. Turned professional back in 1986, sits on his bike so solidly doesn't have the crouch figure of Johan Museu. Nine seconds is the first gap. Back to André Schmil. Well, over all of the years that Ballerini's been riding since 86, he's only won 11 races. But if you look at the races he was second, third or fourth in, it really is a tremendous honours list. So the group is thinning out a bit, and the MG boys are getting themselves organized once more, but you see now it's the others who are chasing. That line being pulled through very, very quickly indeed. Konishev is now having to work, as well as Shmiel and Abdu Japarov. No good being a sprinter if you're not sprinting for first place, and any sprinter will tell you only first place is good enough. There's Abdu Japarov. Konishev doing the work. Schmil coming across the gap, which was left open, I would suspect, by an MG rider. But it's Ballerini who opened the gap on the last climb of the Kemmel. But I have to say, I like and admire the riding of Johan Museo. He is a sprinter, but he is also a real good racing cyclist. He looks for the moves, he doesn't rely on a sprint finish. He goes out knowing the men he intends to keep an eye on, and then he tries to match them wheel for wheel. And that's exactly what he's doing now and driving. Ballerini on the far side, Museo here. He has the strength in depth that he's got five teammates trying to slow down behind, but they do have their hands full. They're not out of sight yet. Well, Ballerini, one of his best wins was the Paris Brussels Classic back in 1990. Had a wonderful season in 1990, which included a win in the sadly now defunct Grand Prix of the Americas in Montreal. And that year finished fourth overall in the World Cup. Tremendous all round rider. I would think he probably looks back at 1993, though, as one of his best seasons. There's the uh, you can see the second place in 1990 for Johan Museo in Ghent Wavelgum. And there's Franco Ballerini's honours, third in 1990. Well, 
He was beaten by Museo. History may well be repeating itself here. They're working well together. Ballerini will want to work Museo for the moment to try and get the gap and at least rid himself of five troublesome MG teammates. But then he's going to have to work out what he's going to do at the finish. There are no more hills now. It's a flat roll into town. It's a very nice town indeed, Wavelgum. And it's a very good finish for the sprinter. And over, until recently, of course, it's always been going to the sprinter. Indeed, it went to the sprinters last year as well, despite the course. Roscioli. Sprook. Konishev. They're all coming back from having done their little turn at the front. Schmill is now doing his turn. Guy Nullens will be next one through in the line. The wind coming from about 11 o'clock on our screens, right across their noses. And that gap, you know, I do believe is closing down. So the chase by the fresher riders who were just sitting at the back when the MG boys were doing the work are now having to chase. And Roscioli's up there with Konishev, and the gap is coming back. And this might be a little bit of a shock to Museo and Ballerini. I think they must have felt assured of the escape. Well, one thing's for sure, this new course is working. We're seeing a much better race than we've seen in this last few years in Ghent Wavelgum. If the sprinters do win, well, they can say they deserved it this year. Judging by all of the team cars up behind this breakaway now, the Bunyo group is making no progress whatsoever. Very compact line, but the system's changed now. The white jerseys are at the back of GBMG, and it's the other teams having to drive the chase. But that gap is almost closed, isn't it? All cameras have been taken out of the gap by the race commissaires, and it's down to 12 seconds. And you know, if... Uh, Museo gets wind of this, he might well, and he knows now, he's looked over his shoulder, he might well turn off now and try another tactic, there's still time. About 19 miles to go to the finish, we're in right charter. And the group, uh, it's still about the same, maybe 10 seconds now. Ballerini no longer looking, he has the same impetus either. They must both be a little bit surprised. So an Italian on an Italian oblique Spanish team and a Belgian who rides from an Italian team. And here they are running into a little bit of friendship there. The exchange of the bidon between the two riders. And I think that's a sign that the white flag is being hauled up for the moment, at least by those two. They've given away a lot of energy in that attack, which at one stage seemed to be going. And can you believe it now? The MG boys are going to have to get back to the front because it looks as though the other riders are taking a breather at the back. Now you can see why Flanders can be such a cruel country for racing. Four seconds is the gap. These are the lowland countryside of Flanders where the wind sweeps across and when the rain comes it makes conditions most unpleasant but it really does breed tough cyclists. Now it looks as though the GBMG boys are now going to also drive the chain, close it down and start again. Abdu Japarov sprinting through, Konishev resisting the temptation. Andre Schmiel coming back up. Well, we always think of Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov as a wonderful sprinter, if an erratic one, which indeed he is in both instances there but he's been an extremely good stage race and road racing cyclist as an amateur when he rode for the old Soviet Union. Peace race rider, which is sadly not the great race it was because there's no necessity anymore for a peace race with the opening up of the former Eastern Bloc countries. Two lonely figures and they're making that group really work hard to bring them back, aren't they? Big chain wheel there, probably a 54 chain wheel on the Johan Museus bike, 54-12 maybe, over these flat roads. 
because of the Kemmelberg and the Cobbles, maybe a 21 back sprocket. These are marvellous roads for racing when they twist and turn. They're narrow, you have to always work. Even in the line, you catch the wind. And Bunyo is back to half a minute, so the group is still pegged. We never see them because our cameras aren't taking us back there. But that group is, will occasionally have this group in sight. So Bunyo is still in that group. And doesn't seem concerned by the fact that he's got Abdu Japarov up here either. All together. Wiped out in the mid-afternoon sun here in Ghent Wevelgum. But if this group comes down to the line, we will be treated to a cracking sprint finish. There are so many riders can sprint here. Enough anyway to confuse Abdu Japarov as to which wheel to follow. I would think he'll pick up Museo's wheel. It's the obvious choice, but watch out for Konishev. And the GB boys now reassessing because, in fact, Museo has come to the back here and is having a chat with Max Chiandri. And he's now going to have a chat with his team manager, too, just to see what's going on as far as the chase behind is concerned. He may not like the news, which is the half-minute gap only to the Bunyo group, which includes Olaf Ludwig, Dagoto Lauritsen, who tried so hard and failed only just to crown an excellent career with a world championship win in his own country in Norway, where the world championships went for the first time last year into 100 years of cycling. He rode so well in front of his own king, but of course, as we all know, in the end, it was Lance Armstrong from the Lone Star State of Texas who rode away to a great victory. A minute, so the gap has opened immensely again. They just cannot get on terms, and they've done this right across Flanders now. They've been nearly here and gone back, nearly here and gone back, and at the moment, they're back. Bottle carrying time for Chandri. And certainly uh, the GB boys are going to have to rethink this. It would be unthinkable if they lost this race with six riders in the breakaway. I'm sure the team manager would sack half of them because with six men in a leading group of 13, you should never lose. The obvious thing to do now would be to start a series of attacking riding sending different riders up the road to make the remaining riders here chase them down in the hope that sooner or later one would stay away. And for that reason, it might work against Johan Museo getting his win. That's Museo at the back, rapidly rejoining the line. Well, next week, we'll see all the fancy bikes with suspension coming out for the Paris-Roubaix and they say there is a special bike coming off the production line of Bianchi with suspension front and rear for Johan Museo and indeed for Carlo Bowmans who's also in this breakaway. Nothing like the reality of the Parve of the north of France for a great test bed for machinery. There's the run down again and still the same riders are there surprisingly all back together again. Tactics are difficult to discern now because the riders can't ease up here to try and play any cards because they know the proximity of the chase pack. And in fact, as I speak, it's gone back another 16 seconds, so they're pulling away now. They'll feel if they can get to 130 that the Bunyo group will not make contact now. Ballerini again talking to Museu. Rivals they may be, but they seem to be making good friends today. They've been in the breakaways together. They've shared a bid on together. And I would think they're talking in Italian. And Roscioli, well, he wanted his team car, but somebody's gone through on the inside, and Roscioli's picked up the move, I think, because that's an enormous attack there, and Ballerini's trying to get onto terms as well. Judging by the style, it's Museu who has gone. They were talking one minute. And next minute, they're chasing each other down. 
Well, the idea of the attack was to try and go before that right-hand bend. Maybe a change of wind direction coming up. Which just might cause a slowdown of the chase pack, but not so at the minute. And that's Carlo Bowman's the last man to react to the group as we get into narrow roads here now. Advantage always with the likes of Bowman's and Museo, who know these narrow roads so well. Museo's probably spent many lonely hours on the bikes for his seven-hour training days around these roads in the years gone by. I think they've brought the group back together here. That's Schmill who's got to the front with Konishev. Roscioli. But the fact that we've got three different riders chasing, we may well find that one rider has slipped away. No, the MG boys are coming back up to the front. So the breakaway has regrouped all together. And Ballerini has slipped to the rear of the field. Although it might be Guy Nullens actually who's gone to the rear of the field. Ballerini's halfway up. No, it's Ballerini. Here he is, sitting on the end of the line. And the Histor team car, Nova Mai, that's uh, trying to get a word with Guy Nullens yet again, but not having a great deal of success. The team itself, uh, incidentally, not having a great deal of success this, this year either. Zandvoort, 22 kilometres from the finish, about 13 miles to go. Now at last, the message for Guy. Although how on earth he can work out handling all of these riders on the GB team, I really don't know. But there's another rider gone the far side of the road. So they are doing the one-on-one -on -one attacks now. This is what the MGGB boys are doing. They're launching the men up the road and making the others chase them down. The weakeners have started. And the reaction surely will not keep on coming from those individually sponsored riders. There's another attack gone. Great lesson in team tactics now for those of you who are growing up as racing cyclists you can watch a big team at work here because in ability there's not much between these riders when you get riders of the quality of Abdu Japarov Museu Ballerini they've seen it all before but the the power of the numerical increase is on the side of Museu and the gap can you believe is coming down again a minute and four seconds now back to Bunyo that man must occasionally see this breakaway and really can't understand why he can't get on. But the reason is because of the continual attacking that's coming from the MGB riders. And we've got another one going now. And the elastic once again stretches. We're now heading into a little stretch of cobblestones here at Zandvoort. Just over a mile in length. And I think it's Konishev who's coming with the reaction. So Konishev for me is the danger man in this breakaway. He's a clever rider. There's the cobblestones as most of them choose the sidewalk. Because as you can see now, for the minute at least, there's a little bit of chaos here. There's a scrabble for wheels. And Schmiller's at the back. So too is Ballerini right now. Guy Nullens. Little Abdu Japarov for catching an express train of two GB riders. Well, one, I think is Roscioli there. There's Spruk. And these attack and counter-attack moves is going to keep Bunyo at bay. Well, there's nine riders chasing and there's one just ahead, the two just ahead, and here they are, Konishev. And the tall figure here with Konishev is, uh, I think it's Carlo Bowman's who went with Konishev. In fact, it's Wilfred Peters, number 15, who's gone with Konishev. So the Russian along with Peters now. Peters is a domestique on the team of Bianchi. He's the weakener for the team today. He's trying to make them attack. He's got Konishev. He won't want to go anywhere with him. Konishev will pack a good sprint finish. And in fact, it looks as though Peters here has gone away on his own because there is Konishev. And Konishev has a problem. 
I think he's pointing to his back wheel. His back wheel is flat. Oh, that is a great shame. Konishev was there with Peters and has punctured in his back wheel. There'll be no car there. You'll have to wait till the breakaway has gone by. And we can see it again here. The hand goes up. Um, that is awful little shame for him because he was clear there with Wilfred Peters. And you see, Lecabont means a flat tyre in Flemish. And you can see that for yourself. The cobblestones have claimed the victim of the Russian. And it's left Wilfred Peters out in front with five MGGB riders who are not going to chase him down for sure. So, once again, the advantage swings to the Italian team and the individually sponsored riders in this breakaway are now going to have to take up the chase and try and bring him back. There is Peters. I'm getting a lesson in Flemish today. Kopf von der Wedstred means the head of the road race. And he's gone. And there's one single rider trying to cross the gap. Once they saw Konishev come back, the whole team tactics changed again. Riding a little bit like Roscioli. Trying to cross the gap to the leader. Now, would this be the move? Because the gap is opened again. No, it's not very far ahead indeed. And the chase group hesitating a little bit to reorganize themselves. As we've got uh, Roscioli, it is, coming up to the leader. But it looks as though the close down is also taking its effect too. And poor old Fabio is going to look around underneath his armpit and see that the race is rejoining without Konishev by the look of it. So Peters, Roscioli, Andre Schmil is the man who's brought the group up. And I'm sure that also has opened up the gap. You can hear them shouting at one another now because they're organising chases and regroup. And now they're stopping, and they're now shouting at each other to pick up the pace again. Well, I'm quite sure that the Lotto rider and the Mapai class rider, the Palti rider, are not going to pick up the pace. They're going to say, well, you've got the men to the GB boys, you pick up the pace. Another word in the ear of Guy Nullens. If they play cat and mouse for too long, then that group containing Bunyo and Ludwig will be up here very, very quickly indeed. They've also got Andrea Perron in there, and Frederic Moncassan is back, although he looked in trouble on the climb of the Kemmelberg. He's made it back into that group. Stefano Collegier, the Italian for the Mobili team, he's up there as well. And Joe Plankert, the last of the great Plankert riders, the youngest one. He, too, is in that chase group. Bowman's number 13. Shandri's number 16. Konishev is the leader having to do all the chasing because this group has split again. A lack of concentration. Somebody opened the door. And you see the GB boys are sitting at the back now. They'll be carried along or the group will go away. It'll cost them two of the pawns on the GB team, but they've got their Mamuseo and Ballerini, indeed, also in that lead group. Tremendous tactics being played all of the time now. What a great race this is turning out to be. The 56th race from Ghent to Wavelgum. Bowman, Shandri, Nullens and Konishev. That is this group we're seeing here. But the big names we're missing are now in the forward group. Abdu Japarov has gone up there. Roscioli must have gone up there as well. The next little climb. It's nothing serious, this. Hillevelt. 600 meters and a bit of a scrabble just look at the gaps now forming between these riders i think everybody committed to their maximum in this breakaway quite clearly the proximity of that bunyo group is causing some consternation up here we're getting to be a regrouping stage again and museo will continue to be concerned by the presence of abdu japarov well recovered from his problem as we go into the last 10 miles of the race. There are still some lone escape opportunists. Men like Ballerini will try to go alone, but I think he's the one man that most of this breakaway will mark. They see him as the real possible winner of this break, but I think he'll have to go alone. He will not win this race in the sprint. Schmil knows Abdu Japarov very much indeed. One of the few riders in this group who can actually speak to him as well. 
Although, in fairness, Abdu Japarov does speak Italian these days. So the pace being set by Roscioli, Ballerini, and Museo going everywhere Ballerini goes, and Abdu Japarov going everywhere Museo goes. And there's Andre Schmil, a man who could well take a lone gamble. And they're still concerned about the whereabouts of the race behind. Ballerini very much so. In fact, all of this whistleblowing, I think, is alerting to the riders that that chase group is, in fact, closing down on them. They'll get very worried if they start to move out the team cars. Museo has already struck once this year in Kerner Brussels Kern, which is another one of the world's minor classic races here in Belgium. Second in the Tour of Flanders. So he has started with the good form of the season. But the Nova My team only here with Guy Nullens, missing very much the sprinter Wilfred Nellison. He started off so well this year. Five wins. And then in that Kuna Brussels Kuna, he broke his collarbone in a rather nasty spill. He'll be back soon, no doubt about that. But they could do with him back right now because he might, in fact, give Museo a real run for his money, but he's not here. And just look how this race has split up again. Well, the group is being closed in on all of the time, and there could be a big upset coming this way. There's Roscioli, Ballerini, Museu. And an attack gone off the front, and it's one of the GB boys, and I think it's Wilfred Peters who's gone. He's the one with the tall, thin legs, and he's gone. And no reaction, surprisingly, from anybody. Oh, yes, Roscioli's decided to give it a go. Roscioli chases him down. Abdu Japarov wanting somebody else to do the work and finds it. And now the Lions settling back into the counter-attack and Abdu is going to have to hook up to that back wheel as fast as he can. Well, Zbigniew Spruk is not closing down the gap quick enough. And in fact, Museo not prepared to counter the move of his teammate and I'm pretty sure it's Wilfred Peters who went up there. And Spruck a little bit surprised at that. He just turns and stares at Johan Museo. He gets no reaction. So Schmil has to come through from the back. And Abdu. And it looks to me as though that attack is going to be neutralized again. Well, Roscioli has really grown in stature since his victory in the three days of La Panna. That's a race which goes around the coastline of Belgium. It's in a very, very desolate area in winter. And spring is very often, to many of these riders, does feel like winter. You catch the weather coming in off the North Sea. And again, Abdu never does more than he feels he has to. He makes the others chase down. His Attitude is that Museo wants to win this race. If he does, he's going to have to pick up the leaders, and he's right so far. Oh, maybe he's just tired because of the way that gap has opened again. And Abdu having to really hurt himself to close it down once more, but he's done it. Has this crouched little short extension of a sprinter. Not a very comfortable position for a long-distance rider, I'm sure of that. And the breakaway thinned down a little bit. I think uh, Max Chiandri is one of the riders who has been dropped now from this league group. And I haven't seen Bowman's of late either. They may have got uh, dropped in the last purge. So GB boys down a couple of teammates now. And the riders who sat on, well, they've still got frisky legs. Abdu looks to be in a bit of trouble, but he won't be if he gets to the sprint finish. It's surprising what the sight of a finishing banner does for you. Ballerini looks as though he's been back to speak to his team car, coming back up to the line. He doesn't look at all tired, does he? And again, it, almost as if he tapped Museo there. And he looks just like he's, he's gone again. I don't know whether he was sort of warning Museo he was going to attack. I can't think why he would do that, but he's gone. He's gone, and the reaction forced again from GB. Museo following the wheels. But he can't rip away like a sprinter might, and there you have it. He stopped again. It's not difficult to mark Ballerini because he doesn't have the explosive leave from the big field. 
that you actually do need. And now the GB boys have countered the move and they've gone again. And once more, Abdu sort of a counters, counters the attack and then looks over his shoulder once more for assistance. I think they'll leave it to Schmil, three men back to have to close this down because they're trying to ease away that GB rider. It's turning out to be quite a sunny afternoon as we head down now towards the finishing wave of gum. It is Schmil who's first across the group. We've now got six riders in this league group, seven riders. And the seventh rider is going from the back. A perfect place to attack. Almost cut out there. Unfortunately, the motorbike was in a good position for us, but not for the attack. And it spoiled the attack of that GB rider. I think it was the small figure of uh, Ludwig Willems who tried, but he was shut down because he, his run was spoiled a little bit. Well, all of a sudden, we again see a number of GB riders here at the front, and each one of them anxious and very frisky indeed. Museo might well have told them to start mixing it once more. We've got to break up this sprint, and we've got to get rid of Abdu Japarov. They'll have noted the fact that he's taking a little bit of a while to close the wheels once the gap's open. That's the sign he's tired. Ballerini there shouting now at Abdu Japarov to come through and somebody's gone from the far right and again it's GB and I think again it's Wilfred Peters. He's gone very quickly down and with no reaction at all. The GB boys won't react as Schmil hasn't. Nulens hasn't. Ballerini's trapped on the left of our picture here. So he's far from ideal to counter the move and they're all watching. You may be able to hear that, but some of the riders are actually shouting themselves uh, to themselves here. This is, in fact, Wilfred Peters, who's gone, and he's settled into a nice time trialing position, and he's got the gap. Well, I make it around about 12 kilometres to go to the finish, something like seven miles. So the carrot is now out front, and now can the others counter the move? We're looking at a man who is a perfect domestique but doesn't win many bike races, and he's gone. Well, I said uh, much earlier as we were talking about this breakaway that the GB boys would send attack after attack and Museo is happy to let this one go. The gap is there. Now the counter is coming. Well, we were just, uh, just about 11 kilometres to go when Wilfred Peters attacked. Ten and a half left now. So we're looking at about 14 minutes of racing. Not much more than that and it's flat all of the way into town and very, very exposed into Wavelgum before we hit the comparative shelter of the buildings. And the GBMG team have got the man away. Now all they've got to do is neutralize the counter-attacks. That's what's happening now, Schmill has tried. Nobody willing to come through. And I'm not surprised, it's Johan Museo on Schmill's wheel, he's not gonna come through. It's going to have to be Ballerini who'll pick up the running. He looks across and goes, but he makes his attacks look so obvious. He stirs at the rider first. And we said that, he's got the gap. Chased by Guy Nullens. In fact, it's not. It's been Brook who's gone after him. Now Museo follows. Sprook knows that the others will counter. Well, counter Ballerini anyway, or will they? In fact, Museo playing no role, deciding that his teammate up the road can handle things quite well himself, Wilfred Peters. I didn't even uh, expect Sprook or try to take him up to the, the wheel of Ballerini, because if Ballerini gets up to, uh, to the leader, then we might have a different race on our hands. Well, this is a surprise. Wilfred Peters has gone, and Ballerini has been allowed his head, and... The, once he's on his own, he might well time trial across the gap. And in fact, not might well, but is coming across the gap. This is a fantastic piece of riding. Ballerini's done well to shake the shadow of that group. And he's absolutely flying across. Franco Ballerini turned professional back in 1986. And has won only 11 races in his career.
And that's only one more, by the way, than the man he's about to catch, Wilfred Peters. In fact, uh, interesting resemblance here because I think Wilfred Peters also turned pro uh, nine years ago. Good solid rider, but never a great winner. And there are plenty of those who find their niche in the sport and get well paid for helping others win the big races. And now Peters looks over. He might have preferred to have seen somebody else, but he's seeing Franco Ballerini. At least he knows if Ballerini has a strong man now to continue the attack. Ballerini not, not hesitating at all, quite prepared to work. I would think might fancy his chances against Wilfred Peters in the sprint. Roscioli, Schmiel, now a little bit disorganization here. They have the big sprinter in the group, Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov. They also have the other big sprinter, Johan Museo, and they can expect no help from Museo. Spruck keeps on calling through Museo, who will not do a thing now. He's gone through, he's sitting on the wheel of Abdu Japarov, six kilometers to go at Mena. Ballerini, the man who almost does and never does in the lead. You see his left elbow flick out. That's because he wants now the other riders to come through and do some work. Turning a big gear. Back in 1986, when Ballerini turned professional, he got no wins. In fact, the best result I can remember, he was 25th in the Tour of Lombardy, the Italian classic race. So Osman, as a young professional, it takes a couple of seasons to show through. And in fact, Ballerini didn't really begin to show until 1990. And then he had some great places. Fifth in the Amstel Gold Race and third in this very race in which he now leads, Gent Wevelgum. Tenth in the Tour of Flanders, 19th Paris-Roubaix, and then came the big wins. He, at the end of the season, he sought uh, Paris-Brussels and the Grand Prix of the Americas. But he's always so close to a win. But you know, he hasn't won a race since 1991. And it looks as though the breakaway again is trying to sort itself out. They've been under pressure continually, especially from the chase behind. But now it looks to me as though the GBMG boys have finally got the man away. It's not the man I think they would have wanted, but Museo simply two mark, 13 seconds, and the finish closing in quickly. There'll have to be a very quick decision from this group, and they know if they counter the move, they're going to take Museo with them, and they're going to give him a ride to the finish in which he will surely win the sprint. The GB team have put themselves into this marvelous position and we're now on the run-in towards the finish. So, a man who never wins races, Franco Ballerini, but always gets very close. He's right there in the lead. Wilfred Peters knows if the group comes back, his teammate will win, Johan Museu. And if he could just hold on and win this race, it would be for him, well, a fairy tale result. Nine years a professional, he's won ten races. And I don't know of any races he's won for two years plays his part as a great domestic. The race has reorganized itself here now. Shamil at the back might be thinking of a, a springboard away from this group. Abdu Japarov now feeling that his sprint will be no use because he's losing ground rapidly. On these two leaders, we're inside five kilometers to go, inside three miles from the finish. Peters looks as though he's suffering. Well, he's on the back of one of the best solo riders in the business. and they're holding it together. Now they're into the streets of Wavelgum. The good thing is the streets twist and turn, the nice wide roads, as you can see, they will stay out of sight of that chase group. Out of sight is very often out of mind. Just five riders left in this chase group. Abdu Japarov, Museu, Shmiel, Spruk are the riders in that group, and I think also Konishev is still there too. I'm not sure whether Roscioli is or not. We'll find out when we go back down. The gap is there. This really has taken a lot of work to get this gap from that breakaway today. And every time he come back here to Peters, he's sitting number two. And I think the plot is simple now. He's looking for the win in the sprint. Ballerini is left with absolutely no choice whatsoever but to set the pace. Otherwise, he would lose a high finish. And in fact, Peters would know that if this race came back together now, surely Johan Museo would take the honours.
It's a rare situation this for Wilfred Peters, the chance of a real victory in his career to go down on his honours list. And it's come about really because he was the one that made the attack that only Ballerini counted. The chase now being done by all of the other riders in this breakaway. Andre Schmil, third in the Tour of Flanders last week. And being chased there by Abdu Japarov. And the other one is Vinyesbruck. Just three kilometers to go. Just inside two miles now. Ballerini doing all of the tempo. And I think if I was Wilfred Peters in this uh, way now, I would be feeling those tingles down my spine saying, this is possible. This could be my big chance for a victory. Well, I wonder if he thought this would be the case when he set off this morning from Ghent. I doubt it very much indeed. Schmil, the pacemaker. And this, the man nears the camera, number 11, Johan Museo, just riding along and waiting. If they come back, he'll go for it in the sprint. Otherwise, he's going to have to try and fight out for third place. I don't think they're going to bring the back, quite frankly, right now. 22 seconds, that's asking rather a lot, unless they start finessing and Ballerini does decide to shut down at the front, then they might close in. But Ballerini's never asked anything of Peter since he came up here. He's taken the, the fate of being the rider without the sprint and knowing that if the pack comes back, he will lose for sure. Schmil, you see, is getting upset and Roscioli willing to work as well. Abdu Japarov. <laughs> Still bridging the gaps to those wheels. And Sprook. And in fact, Johan Museo, well, I thought he was going to attack from the back, but maybe he was chasing the reaction there of Andre Schmil. He just went up two or three places, got the wheel of Schmil and shut down again. Just constantly looking over his shoulder, making sure that the group containing Gianni Bunyo, which is in fact closing in on all accounts, is not that close. The last time check we got, they were back to round about 30 seconds on this group. They have dangled there throughout the day. Ballerini coming down towards the closing kilometre or so now. Wilfred Peters just looking over the big broad shoulders of Ballerini there, no doubt to see the whereabouts of the red kite for one kilometre to go. But quite content, and there it is, a kilometre from the finish now. Peters is still number two, Ballerini just looks round him, doesn't even accept the fact he is there. He's more concerned about that group led by Museo Schmil and Abdu Japarov, the sprinters who will take him out. And just look at Peters looking round Ballerini and containing himself. And I would think that's quite difficult to do right now. And a wave under the kilometre banner. I'm not sure whether he's pointing to the kite there to the rest of the group from Johan Museo. Museo would love this group to catch up, of course, but he daren't take the chance and damage his own teammates' risk. A chance of a victory there, but they've gone now, and this will take some containing. So they could contain themselves no longer, and the gap is 20 seconds. Ballerini setting the pace. Peters waiting. These are nervous times. They almost touched the wheel there of Ballerini, but he's gone right up onto the shoulder of Ballerini, and Ballerini beaten immediately, takes the wheel, but he won't come out of the slipstream here of Wilfred Peters, who is going to get one of these rare, great moments. Well, have I spoken too soon? Because Ballerini on the left of our picture is giving a great ride. This is going to be a tremendous finish, and right on the line, and it was close, but I think Wilfred Peters has got the victory. And the GBMG boys, well, they were numerically strong all day, have got the sprint, and third place coming up. Museo is bringing them home. Museo and Schmil. Museo takes it from Andre Schmil. And Abdu Japarov, he struggled all day, will finish this race in fifth place. And so they've come in round about 15, 16 seconds after the front group. Let's have a look at the sprint again, because at this point, I really thought Ballerini was beaten. But then Ballerini took just that moment's drafting in the slipstream of Peters and then came off his wheel well. That banner, I think, had it come a little bit later and Ballerini would have done what I thought was absolutely impossible.
inch by inch Ballerini is clawing back Wilfred Peters and that's why the hook is coming from Peters he leans on him but in the end he gets it by about half a wheel here it is again from the other Finnish camera oh dear me another five or six meters and I think Ballerini but isn't that the story of his life he would have won the stage so Wilfred Peters of Belgium who hasn't won a race all of throughout 1993 gets his 11th win of his career and this without doubt the best well that's the benefit of living and racing on a top team and Museo had to give way to a domestique and he won't be unhappy about that and so there we are on the winners podium at the very top Wilfred Peters of Belgium Ballerini makes the podium again but once more it is not in the number one position and the man missing there is Johan Museo, who hasn't come up to the podium, but he got third place. And in fourth place was indeed Andre Schmiel. In fifth place, Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov, and sixth, Zbigniew Spruk. Although we didn't see them come in, that chase group arrived only 41 seconds down on the winner in the end, and it was led in by Joe Plankert, who got 12th place. There's the result of the Ghent Wavelgum 1994. It really was a great race. And if you're a member of the GBMG team, well, you couldn't have done much better. For Phil Liggett, until we meet again on Paris-Roubaix, it's goodbye.